Michelle's on. Michelle couldn't make the trip. Thanks, Michelle, for getting on. Do you see Michelle's on? Oh, yeah. You're right. You guys are nice. Media Matters, a title that she's very proud of. 
<laughs> Kristen regularly speaks at pro-life conventions and events across the United States, including many college campuses such as Yale, Harvard, Dartmouth, and UC Berkeley. She's done all of this while being a wife to her high school sweetheart, Jonathan, and raising her four children, Gunner, Bear, Maverick, and Gracie, and in her free time, raising awareness for cystic fibrosis, a disease her son, Gunner, and daughter, Gracie, suffer from. Since launching Students for Life, the pro-life generation has been given a voice, and they are using that voice to demand an end to the injustice of abortion. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Kristen Hawkins. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, it's, there are some empty seats up here. There's a couple of empty rows of empty seats for those standing in the back. But thank you for having me. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna be a little jet lagged. I yawn, it's not because you're boring me, it's just because I should be in bed watching episodes of The West Wing uh, with your husband. Um, so I wanna thank you. Thank you for coming out and hearing my perspective uh, on this very important topic. Um, and I know a lot of you will probably have questions, uh, so that's why we have the microphone here and we'd like you to come up and ask your questions after I'm finished with my presentation this evening. So a little bit about me, I grew up in a small town in West Virginia with my parents and my younger sister. My father uh, was raised by a mostly single mother uh, who lived in poverty his whole life. Uh, he thankfully graduated high school, um, got a good paying blue collar job uh, that he hated for 40 years and he actually retired from last Wednesday. We're all very excited <laughs> for him. He married my mother. Uh, after, well, while she was still in college. Um, and that's my family. I came from a pretty normal, normal family, I would say. Normal by my West Virginia, Wellsburg, West Virginia standards. Um, but when I look back at my life, my career, uh, what I've chosen to do in my life, I, I always think about my dad uh, and he, he, him being really that driver for me. Um, really always pushing me to be the best, to do my best, to never give up. Um, you know, going to college and actually getting a full ride scholarship to college and having a career wasn't like a hope that he had for me. It was an understanding uh, that we had. He brought me with a new car and it worked out perfectly. Um, but I always think about those like conversations that he and I would have. He would drive me back and forth to volleyball and basketball tournaments uh, in high school and middle school. And he, and he always talked about why he was pushing me so hard uh, to get to be the best, to get the straight A's, to pass the exams. Um, because what he wanted for my life was that I would have choices, that I could choose what career I wanted to have that I could choose what I wanted to do, that I could seek uh, happiness and fulfillment through whatever I, I wanted to do with my life. But I also knew that, you know, beyond going to college and having a career, that I also wanted to be a mom, uh, I wanted to be a wife. Um, I always saw my mother, who was an awesome example, kind of hustling, uh, being the first person up in the morning, making sure everyone's lunches were made, everyone's you know after school uniforms were done for whatever sporting events, they were clean, they were ready to go, uh, going, to, dropping us off to, to school, going to her job as a teacher, coming back, hurrying up making dinner, getting whatever she put in the crock pot out of the dinner uh, for dinner table, and then taking us to church and some function we had at church that night, and being really that last person up at night, doing dishes, getting the, the house reset for the next morning. And so I thought, you know, a lot when I was in high school, and even a little bit when I was in college, when you, when you hear the word feminist, I always kind of thought of myself as a feminist because, you know, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to have it all. I wanted to have that career. I, I wanted to get that full ride scholarship to college. Uh, I wanted to have that family and have children. And I never felt that because of my gender, because of my biology, uh, that I was any less equal to the men in my class. In fact, I was better than most of them. Uh, I had better grades than all, most of them. Um, I never felt that I was being held back. And so if you would have asked me, like, you know, 15-year-old Kristen, are you a feminist? I would have said, hell yeah, I'm a feminist. Of course I'm a feminist. But today at 32, um, 
I'm pretty sure I don't want that label anymore. Um, even though I'm pretty damn sure my entire life is an example of what I think those first and second wave feminists fought for. That I have a career, that I work outside of the home, that I get, don't get paid less because I'm a female, that I lead a business of you know, 45 plus team members, mostly of women, um, that I'm the breadwinner of my family. My husband actually is now a stay-at-home dad. He educates our children. Um, that you know, he's there right now watching them as one of them's throwing up and texting me play-by-plays of what's going on in my house. And he's there taking care of our children and raising our children while I'm here with you talking about feminism. I know it was ironic. He sent me an email earlier about what he thought I should do with pro-life feminism, where I should put it. Um, he wants me home right now <laughs> helping with the puke, which is understandable. I wish I was there. You see, I like an overwhelming majority of, of Americans. I believe in those same goals of our feminist forefathers, that we want equality and we strive for equality for all human beings, that women should have the right to vote, that women should have the right to speak publicly, to choose and fulfill their educational career goals and their family goals. I do all of that. I you know, Google my name. I speak as much as I possibly can about the issue of abortion, no matter where I'm at. And it's not because um, I'm, you know, I'm not ever told to shut up because I'm a woman. It's usually because I'm somewhere I'm not supposed to be saying that. Um, but, but I'm sure if you ask today's mainstream feminist leaders and today's feminist thought leaders and writers, you know, is Kristen Hawkins a feminist? Can Kristen Hawkins be a feminist? I'm pretty sure they would tell you that I'm not welcome in their movement. And I'm pretty sure those first wave suffragists, those first wave feminists, wouldn't, wouldn't be welcome in their movement either. It's all over one issue. It's the violence of abortion. That's what the issue is, is about. This was demonstrated perfectly last January at the Women's March, nice pussy hat. At the Women's March in DC, I was surrounded by pussies everywhere I went. And we decided, you know, we were going to be there for the Women's March. It, it was going to be a unifying event that women all across the country were going to speak out against violence. So I actually emailed, Facebooked the uh, co-founder, Bob Land, and asked her, you know, could Students for Life be a co-sponsor of this event? I pretty much figured what the answer was going to be. It was true. My request went unanswered. Planned Parenthood was announced two weeks later as a platinum sponsor. But we went anyway. We were there, we had a 20 foot sign, said abortion betrays women. We actually jumped out in front of the march and led the march for several blocks until the uh, middle-aged women started hitting our high school students over the head with their signs. And we had to retreat onto the sidewalk to protect them. But we were there because we wanted to stand with women. We wanted to stand for women. We wanted to stand for those women, women like Kanamaya Munger, who was killed at the hands of her abortionist her, you know, abortionist there in Philadelphia, Kermit Gosnell and his house of horrors. We wanted to be there for her. For Jennifer Morabelli, who was killed just 10 miles outside of Washington, D.C. during her late-term abortion, as her doctor jetted off to his other abortion facility across the country, she laid in her hotel room with her family and bled out. We were there for the millions of women who've undergone abortions, who would see, as a march was passing by, who be holding their whatever signs, you know, F Trump whatever signs, they would see our abortion betrays women sign, look up, nod, and put their head back down. We wanted to be there for the young women who, one young women of my generation, our generation, who've been misogynistically told since you know the early 90s by the Supreme Court that we need abortion that the KCV Planned Parenthood decision, that women need abortion, we have to have abortions because it's critical for us to succeed in the marketplace. I reject those lies of mainstream feminism. I reject that lie that abortion somehow sets me free, that abortion is needed in order to ensure my freedom as a human person, that I must pay somebody to commit a violent act against somebody else in order to be free. I would maintain that abortion has and always will be the opposite of empowerment. It actually has no place in a civil, civil society, especially in the United States. But what happened to feminism in America? 
When did the fight for equality become this extremist agenda advocating for abortion whenever, wherever, in all nine months of pregnancy, and oh, by the way, taxpayer funded? Throughout the different waves of feminism, whether it's the first wave feminist, second wave, third wave, now probably we're in the fourth wave, there have been a few core principles that have always been, remained constant. One's a discipline of nonviolence. The other is a demand for equality. The understanding that one human being should never oppress another or treat another human being like property. These tenets of feminism define abortion. While some abortion advocates will try to muddy the conversation about abortion saying, oh, there's conflicting views about when life begins. The profound reality is that life in the womb is understood in simple biological definition that we learned in elementary and middle and high school. When considering a, quote, distinctive characteristic of a living organism, life is, quote, distinguished by the capacity to grow, to metabolize, to respond to stimuli, to adapt and reproduce. All these things are true of a preborn child. What is inside her is, in fact, a living human being, a member of our human family. But regardless of whether or not you want to believe in that science, abortion is a violence act. It's a destruction of a living human being that once was alive and now is not. Abortion does oppress another human being. It treats another human being as less equal. It says, because of your size, because of your location, I can do whatever I want with your body. So at its core, abortion should always be considered anti-feminist. And our feminist foremothers, the suffragists, they knew this. Mary Wollstonecraft, she kicked off modern feminist thought in her Vindication of Rights to Women in 1792 wrote, women becoming consequently weaker in mind and body that they ought to be were one of the grand ends of their being taken into account. The bearing and nursing children have not sufficient strength to discharge the first duty of a mother and sacrificing to lavishness the parental affection that ennobles instinct. Either destroy the embryo in the womb or cast it off with porn. Nature of everything demands respect and those who violate her laws seldom do so in impunity. Mary Sue Wilson Croft was not like a conservative thinker by any thought. She believed men and women should be educated equally and together. Uh, she's a very interesting historical figure. Elizabeth Candy Stanton. Elizabeth Stanton served for several years in the slavery abolitionist movement with her husband, alongside her husband. Actually became disillusioned with the slavery abolitionist movement because they refused to allow women to lead that movement. She was best friends, became best friends with Susan B. Anthony, was the editor of the revolution, Susan B. Anthony's magazine. She wrote an article about infanticide. There must be a remedy for such a crying evil as this, but where shall be found at least begin, if not in the complete enfranchise and elevation of women. Sarah Norton, the first woman to win uh, acceptance uh, to Cornell University. Victoria Woodhall, the first woman to run for president. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman to earn a medical degree. In her diary, she wrote, the gross perversion and destruction of motherhood by this abortionist filled me with indignation and awakened active antagonizement. That the honorable term female physician should be exclusively applied to those women who carried on the shocking trade seemed to me a horror. It is utter degradation of what might and should become a noble profession for women. Dr. Charlotte Lozier, once again, one of the first female physicians in our country. Susan B. Anthony, perhaps best known as you know, the leader of the suffragists, the first wave feminist, was also pro-life, pro against abortion. She actually refused to allow ads that were very lucrative in her day uh, to actually be taken out in the revolution. These ads were before like herbal remedies to induce miscarriages. They were abortion, abortion ads. The entire print run of the revolution refused to publish uh, those ads. She wrote multiple times about abortion. You don't even have to believe me. You can believe Saturday Night Live. They were doing a skit not too long ago. I don't know if any of you all saw it. Or these really cool women who had their, they were, they were going, they were in Buffalo, no, Rochester. 
That's where her home is, her birthplace is in Massachusetts. They were in Rochester, and they went to see a Susan B. Anthony house, and their cell phones, and the ghost of Susan B. appears, and she starts talking to him. They're like, this is awesome. And they take their, their selfies of Susan B., and then she starts talking about other things, and then the girls kind of lose an interest because they're millennials like me who, like, after five minutes, we're on the next thing, and they're <laughs> thinking about their Uber and how they're going to get to, to the train station and all this stuff. Um, and at the very end, Susan B. yells out, abortion is murder. And the girls just look at her and like walk away. And they're spoofing Susan B. But it was great that Su even SNL acknowledged what, what we've been saying for years, that Susan B. Anthony believed abortion was murder. Uh, this is actually, actually something that gets kind of controversial. People don't want to admit that. Alice Paul, the original author of the ERA, um, if you ever be able to see uh, Hilary Swank in Iron Jawed Angels, my husband used to show in his uh, high school um, civics classes about that, those final years of the fight for our, our right to vote. She wrote, abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. Alice Paul actually predicted dead on what was gonna happen in the 1960s and 1970s. Because 40 years after that 19th Amendment, 40 years after we won our right to vote, second wave feminism was kicked off. The 1963 Equal Pay Act, which made it illegal to pay men and women different wages for different, the same work, as well as in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which actually included provisions preventing sex discrimination in hiring uh, and promotion decisions. Contrary to popular belief, Betty Friedan did not talk about uh, the so-called right to abortion and contraception in her first edition of Feminist Mystique. The book is awfully, you know, often held as responsible for kicking off that second wave of feminism. It appropriately addressed that restlessness that many women at the time were feeling in the 1950s and the 1960s of, of lacking that fulfillment in their homes. It was actually two men, Larry Ladder, the uh, former executive director of the Hume War Fund, a believer in the impending population bomb, which never happened in the 1970s, a eugenicist, and his friend Bernard Nathanson, a, an abortion provider in New York State who formed NARAL, the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws, who decided to take abortion out of like the white upper, you know, upper middle class male movement and they, they needed to attach it to this new movement, this growing new movement of feminism. It was Ladder who knew Friedan from uh, various Marxist circles in New York City that these men met with Friedan and convinced her that this right to abortion, this right to contraception was totally necessary for the equality of women, that women were never gonna be equal in our country uh, unless those, those rights were provided. Two men. Now tonight I'm not arguing that, you know, women go back to the 1950s and like barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. You know, I love being pregnant, it's like one of my favorite things. I'm always trying to convince my husband when we have one more baby. Um, and I do cook in my kitchen barefoot because I always spill stuff all over me. I'm not arguing for that. But I also would say I don't see a way forward for today's mainstream feminist movement that's, that's become all about abortion, that demonize anybody who makes that choice that is an abortion, who advocates for choices that aren't abortion. To, today in America, women have full equality with men under the law. Now, are there things we need to overcome? Yeah, there are. But we have incredible freedoms in the United States. Freedoms that women in other nations can scarcely hope to attain in their lifetime. Women can be successful and achieve their dreams, no matter their backgrounds or their circumstances. We live without fear of you know, female genital mutilation. We live without fear of being forced to becoming child brides uh, to a violent abuser. We live without fear of being robbed of our basic human rights. Unlike our sisters in other nations, we can vote, we can run for office, we can own property, we can inherit wealth, we can achieve education goals, we can work in the career of our choice, and I can walk in front of my husband or beside him on the street, and I can drive a car. Maybe not too well, but Yet, the abortion industry and to those in today's mainstream feminist movement will claim it's not enough, that women's rights are under attack, stand up and fight back. I know all slogans, they've been screamed at me for hours on end in front of the Supreme Court. That our interests in an integrated and successful life, though, have been reduced 
have been reduced to abortion hormonal contraception. That's what it's all about. And they've institutionalized this belief everywhere. It's in the words of the abortion worker who told my friend Allie, just, it'll be over 10 minutes, you can go back to school like nothing ever happened. Certainly didn't happen that way for Allie after her abortion. It was in the words of the college administrator at Fordham, a Catholic university in New York City, a very well-renowned Catholic university, that told our friend Eleanor, well, yeah, you can stay in school if you're pregnant, but you can't live here anymore. And oh, if you move off campus, we're going to have to take away your $10,000 a year housing scholarship. Or you can just have that abortion. We've been sold a bag of lies from mainstream feminists, is what I would argue. I think that first, that lie, that first lie that we've been sold from mainstream feminism, that first myth, is that sex is without consequence. Right now in 2017, we are living in a CDC self-proclaimed ST epidemic. For those who are sexually active, under 25, one in two will contract at least one ST. One in two. A couple months ago, our Students for Life group in Ohio uh, petitioned their school to allow them to have a booth at the Sex Week Fair. You know what we were told? No, you're not allowed because talking about abortion, talking about contraception, you're not sex positive enough. This is only for sexual positivity. There are real consequences to sex that we have to talk about. Every decision you make has a consequence. I mean, this isn't rocket science. Sex has some very interesting consequences. Some are inconvenient, they're like a rash, something you have to get taken care of quickly before you spread it to someone else, hopefully. Some are, some are really inconvenient. Having to parent a child and financially support a child for 18 plus years. Some are dangerous, some are deadly. HPV, cervical cancer, HIV. Once sex was trivialized and taken outside of that lifelong commitment, we had to be sold that second line of mainstream feminism. And that, that contraception is necessary for the advancement of women. That our fertility as women is not a gift, but it's something that has to be suppressed. It has to be masked, it has to be controlled. Look, men and women are different. <laughs> Biology, social scientists, everyone tells us this. We, there's deep-seated differences between men and women. We know this. You don't have to go very far than to look at our brains. Women, we're excellent multitaskers. And it's because the neurons in our brains are actually more connected than men. Men like to focus on one task and get it done really well. You can ask Stephen Rhodes, he's a professor at UVA who's written extensively about this. He's written extensively about brain function, how men and women are different. How there's certain antidepressant drugs that work on men but don't work on women because our brains are different. Like this is not a controversial fact. And actually Rhodes actually went on in one of his papers, he talked about how the danger of it, you know, this gender line society um, tends to transform the goal into making women more like men. So male interests, male values, male priorities actually end up setting that agenda. It makes it harder for women inspiring to break through the ranks of the powerful. Why do we as women ha feel like we have to become like men biologically? I can do something that half of you in this room can't do. And I'm proud of it. And it makes, <laughs> makes me a little bit more superior, I would say. We know from the writings that the first wave of feminists, the suffragists, actually opposed contraception as well. They actually believed, and they wrote extensively about how they believed it would lead to the promiscuity of husbands, of partners. And that's what we have today. Unfortunately, we have a generation of men who have no qualms about using our bodies for pleasure, and then when we get pregnant, we suffer one of those natural consequences of engaging in sex, they tell us to just go get it taken care of, that they'll get the money for us to go get it taken care of. You don't have to look very 
You don't have to look much further than pornography addiction. This isn't even a controversial thing to talk about today. Left and right are both fighting pornography addiction in our culture. And we know that not only can hormonal contraception, hormonal contraception, cause an abortifacient, meaning that when egg and sperm unite, a unique whole living human being is created, and usually in the fallopian tube, and a lot of hormonal contraceptive devices and drugs won't allow that unique whole living human being, that human embryo, that zygote, from implanting in the, in the woman's uterus, the mother's uterus, so that's an early abortion. So not only do we know that abortifacient, you know, hormonal contraception can be abortifacient, we also know that it doesn't prevent pregnancy. In fact, a recent study from BPAS, which is the British Pregnancy Advisory Service, they are the Planned Parenthood of the UK. This, this BPAS, this abortion vendor, just said just that this summer. In the Huffington Post, they wrote, it turns out that over half of women who procure abortions do so because of failure of their contraceptive method. In fact, a study over 60,000 women found that contraceptive use contributes to greater likelihood that women will have later term abortions, 20 weeks and later, because they assume they can't get pregnant using contraception and miss early pregnancy signs result. In response to the study, the PBAS chief executive said, this is the leading abortionist in the UK, said, our data shows women cannot control their fertility through contraception alone, even when they are using some of the most effective methods. Family planning is contraception and abortion. Abortion is birth control that women need when the regular method lets them down. We've seen the scientific articles come out about how hormonal contraception is bad for our bodies. Ricky Lake, the former you know, talk show host, is uh, producing a documentary right now called Swinging the Pill. I suggest you follow them on Facebook. It's fascinating. They're not against abortion. They, they won't even talk about abortion. I think if you would ask any of them who are working on it, they're probably pro-abortion. But all they're talking about are the hormonal contraceptives and the, and the negative effects on our bodies as women. The National Cancer Institute uh, partnered with Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and found that women who use birth control pills could face a minimum of 50% increased risk of development for breast cancer. And they actually went on in this study to list the common types of birth control and you know what's the dosage of the hormones and what's the likelihood for increased breast cancer risk. A Danish study that came out this fall, the American Journal of Psychiatry, tracked nearly, this was the largest study of birth control ever conducted, tracked nearly 50 Five, sorry, 500,000 women for eight years, so a half a million women for eight years, found the risk of attempting suicide for women who are using the birth control, hormonal birth control pill, was twice as high. Risk for completion of a suicide was three times as high. And don't forget to mention that the World Health Organization, Organization has actually labeled the birth control pill as a group one carcinogen. The same level classification, it's given cigarettes and asbestos. Despite all of this, how many of your friends know these facts or even aware of them? We don't drink milk with hormones in it. We only eat organic meat. We want cage-free organic eggs, but then we pump our bodies full of these artificial, artificial hormones. And in fact, anytime I bring this up, anytime I talk about this, it's a slurry of dozen, you know, of, of tweets and dozens of Facebook messages. It gets so bad if I'm on TV talking about this, I have to turn off Facebook or, you know, for the weekend. Because just simply talking about these risk factors makes people very angry and upset. Because we've been duped again into those lies of the mainstream feminist movement. That everything they're saying is gospel truth. And the information that's counter to it, it's hard, it's personal. It affects all of us, and so we, we internalize it. We view these things as attacks. But I reject that notion that I have to put carcinogenic, potentially carcinogenic drugs into my body in order to be equal to men in our society and our nation, in order to fit in this world. So when contraception fails, and it does, birth control pill has a 9% um, failure rate, so 9% a year. Um, if you use condoms, it's 18%. Just saying, I went again to a plane that was going to crash 9% times a year, but whatever. When contraception fails, and it can, and it does, 
whether you're using a barrier method contraceptive or a hormonal type of contraceptive, we have to be sold these third and fourth lies of mainstream feminism. Third one is that abortion is needed for women to achieve our goals, and the, and the fourth one is that it's harmless and it's safe. Let's start with the fact that the abortion debate today is not whether or not abortion kills. We know it kills. 1995, feminist Naomi Wolf wrote in The New Republic, uh, the statement that abortion stops at being hard is incomparably true. Pro-abortion feminist Camille Paglia wrote in Salon, I've always frankly admitted that abortion is murder, the extermination of the powerless by the powerful. In Conscious, which is a Catholic magazine, former Catholics for Choice president, uh, well-known pro-abortion activist Frances Kiesling declared, the fetus does have value. So the argument today is not whether or not you know, that fetus is alive or is a person or whether abortion kills. The argument we hear today on campuses across the country is whether or not you know, abortion is needed for women's freedom, for our well-being, that we have to have access to abortion in all nine months of pregnancy for whatever reason. You see, instead of truly seeking to serve her, to serve her in that moment of crisis and confusion, we just tell her to Google it, to call the Planned Parenthood, which is conveniently located close to the college or high school campus. As she seeks advice from her boyfriend, her friends, her family, she hears that feminist mantra repeated over and over again. It's your body, your choice. The subtext of that mantra is just get taken care of. Instead of finding encouragement, instead of finding reassurance, instead of saying someone saying, this is going to be hard, but you can actually do this, she's threatened with the end of her education or her career goals. Because we've legalized abortion, because seven men on the Supreme Court legalized abortion all nine months of pregnancy, our nation has half hasn't had to have these difficult conversations about what we can actually do for her, what we can actually support her with, how we can help her. We know that no woman ever feels that enthusiasm when she's about to have an abortion. I've been there from abortion facilities many times, standing there quietly praying, watching her go in. She's not smiling, she's not energetic, she's not typing away excitedly on her phone about she'll be right there later tonight. She just has to stop in for a quick abortion. No one's excited to have an abortion. It's a solemn, it's a sad event. You can look at the abortion facility's own websites. Many abortionists now offer um, spiritual counselors who will come in and pray over the, your, your dead baby's body and I'll let you take your baby home to bury your baby. It's a sad song. She's not there because she feels like she's exercising some great right. She's there because she feels like she has no choices, that she's run out of choices, that this is her only option, that this is that moment of desperation. First wave feminist Maddie Brinkerhoff wrote, when a man steals to satisfy hunger, we may safely conclude that there's something wrong in society. So when a woman destroys the life of her unborn child, it is evidence that either by education or circumstances, she has been greatly wrong. Men and women, I would argue that we failed her through our own laziness. That we've led her to the doors of that Planned Parenthood and that abortion facility. Who are going to profit from her despair. We've failed her. And because I'm at a Christian school, the church has failed her. The Christian church has failed her. Now the additional consequences of abortion, beyond destroying nature, beyond destroying your offspring or child, are those health risks to her. Researchers in Finland have identified strong statistical association between abortion and suicide in a record-based study. They found the mean annual suicide rate for women was 11.3 per 100,000 women. But the rate for women following abortion was 34.7% per 100,000. Per 100, three times higher. The suicide rate associated with birth, by contrast, was half the rate of all women and less than one-sixth rate of suicide among women who had abortions. Over 20 studies have linked abortion increased rates of drug and alcohol abuse. The lowest incident rate of PTSD reported following abortions is 1.5%, which translates to over 600,000 cases. 
Another study found that 14% of American women have all the symptoms of PTSD and attribute them to their abortions, with as many as 65% reporting some, but not all, symptoms of PTSD. Analysis of 15 years of published research in the British Journal of Psychiatry found that women who had undergone an abortion experienced an 81% increased risk of mental health problems. 81%. These are not pro-life, anti-abortion sources, I'm quoting. In 2003 landmark article, an obstetrical and gynecological survey, compiled the results of several studies on abortion. They showed that induced abortion increased the risk of placenta previa and later pregnancy by 50% and doubles the risk of preterm birth. Placenta previa, um, I don't know how many of you know about my sister who died of it last year. She was giving birth to my nephew. It's when the placenta impacts at the bottom of the cervix, and if you go into labor, basically your placenta can detach from the uterus and there's internal bleeding. It's bad. Preterm births accounted for 12.1% of all births in 2002, up from 8.9% in the, in the 1980s. And to November 2007 article in the Journal of Reproductive Medicine attributed 31.5% of preterm birth deliveries to induced abortion. Preterm births, are, if you don't know anything about them, they're risky for children who survive them. There's um, developmental delays, there's physical delays, the risk of death is very high. You have a 38 times greater risk of develop having cerebral palsy. Plus, births before 32 weeks actually increase a woman, the mother's risk of breast cancer. A landmark study published in 2014 in Cancer Cause and Control concluded just one abortion increased the risk of breast cancer by 44%. For women who have two abortions, the risk rose to 76% and then doubled after three or more abortions. The Chinese study, a third study that year, um, showing a positive link between abortion and breast cancer was actually a meta-analysis of 36 studies covering 14 provinces in China, all which compared the risk of breast cancer among women who induced abortions to those who did not. That same summer, a Bangladesh study suggested that abortion raised the breast cancer risk up to 20%. Once again, this is from China, not a pro-life country by any means. And let me be clear about this. We don't need abortion vendors like Planned Parenthood preying off of our generation. We have enough resources in our communities to support her. There are thousands of federally qualified health centers, FQHCs for a government term across the country. FQHCs outnumber Planned Parenthoods 20 to 1. There's several right here in Tacoma. You can go to findahealthcenter.hrsa.gov to find the federally qualified health centers. There are more than 8,000 federally qualified health centers across the country. There are less than 600 Planned Parenthood abortion facilities. Federally qualified health centers serve 21 million men, women, and children every year. Planned Parenthood boasts about 2 million. The number is actually going down. Yet, Planned Parenthood receives three times, three times the federal funding than federally qualified health centers, while providing less than half of all the services that federally qualified health centers have to provide. And FQHC, FQHCs serve patients at a cheaper rate. The average cost per patient FQHC is $146. Planned Parenthood is $185. If every single Planned Parenthood in the country would shut down tomorrow, my goal, if every single Planned Parenthood would shut down the country tomorrow, FQHCs would only have to see two more patients a week to handle their patients. That's crazy. FQHCs actually have to provide mammograms. They have to provide well women care. They have to provide OB care. Planned Parenthood doesn't do those things. And if you need a service that FQHC doesn't have, they are legally obligated to help transport you to a center that does. Planned Parenthood doesn't do that. Planned Parenthood is not just a health center that happens to do abortions. They spend their money to further the abortion culture. They are the driving force in Washington, D.C. and in state capitals on legislation that lift safety standards on abortion. They bragged in Rolling Stone magazine about spending more than $30 million in the election of Hillary Clinton. 99% of their political donations in 2016 went to guess what? Democrats. They're not just a 501c theory like FQHCs are. They're also C4s. They're also PACs, and all their affiliates, their 70-plus affiliates, have political action committees as well. 
FQHDs can't do that. They spend zero dollars on federal lobbying in elections. They've already proven that they're responsible for our, with our taxpayer dollars. Why not reallocate that money to them? Planned Parenthood makes over $100 million every year in profit. Pull up Planned Parenthood's annual reports over the years, and you'll see something shocking. While their federal dollars have increased over the past 10 years, and while their abortions have increased over the past 10 years, everything else has declined. Their good services have declined. Between 2006 and 2015, the number of clients Planned Parenthood served dropped by 19%, while their revenue rose by 30%. That's a freaking great business model by any business standard. While cancer screenings, prenatal services have been cut in half, abortions have skyrocketed from 289,000 in 2006 to 323,000 in 2015. Abortion is down nationally about 12%, only down 1.5%, 1.6% Planned Parenthood. 2006, Planned Parenthood committed one out of every five abortions. Today, in 2017, 2018, oh gosh, I need <laughs> They commit one out of every three abortions. They've only increased their share of the abortion industry. Further proof in the Planned Parenthood's abortion culture is in their own quotes and how they talk about it. Last uh, March, actually, Ivanka Trump, President Trump's daughter, met with Planned Parenthood. Ivanka is known to be a pro-choice, pro-Planned Parenthood supporter. She met with Cecile Richards, the, the president, the outgoing president of Planned Parenthood. And they were trying to find middle ground in this debate because people like me are demanding that they are defunded of our taxpayer dollars. And so the resolution that was proposed to Planned Parenthood was, well, why don't you just create a separate business, Abortion Inc. or whatever, then we can continue to fund you, but we can, we can ensure all the people like Kristen that their, their taxpayer dollars aren't going to the abortion industry. After Cecile and Planned Parenthood leaked that meeting, Cecile Richards tweeted out, Planned Parenthood is proud to provide abortion, a necessary service that's vital to our mission as birth control and cancer screening. Let me say that again. A necessary service that's as vital to our mission as birth control and cancer screenings. Abortion is never necessary as a cancer screening. Like, for her to equate that is crazy. That's Planned Parenthood's own tweet. That's what they believe. And when she does decide to have children, when she decides, okay, I'm in that place in my career. I have my apartment in Manhattan. I've got it all down now. Now I can become that mother and, and have those children. When she decides to do that, that's when the real bitch of the of mainstream feminism comes in to bite you, that last lie. It's where it rears its ugly head. And it's this. You can have it all. It's easy. You know, I, I thankfully have never had an abortion. I have many friends, obviously, who serve in the pro-life movement who, who are post-abortive. But I do know something about trying to juggle a family, a marriage, and a career. In fact, it's, some, it's the number one question I'm often asked by young women who ask me to mentor them. It's this lie that it's easy, that you can have it all, that we're women, we can do everything. It's the, it's the biggest lie that took me um, the longest to overcome and see through. Because despite the fact that I was working 20 hour days for multiple years on end, commuting 90 minutes back and forth to work, sleeping in my office, my little Ikea love seat um, twice a week, going to the gym just so I could shower in the morning, it was a great way to make me work out. But despite doing all that, I wasn't able to do it all. It was impossible. Something always had to give. And as a working mother, it's always a constant struggle of priorities. And what I always tell my mentees this is that this is a feminist myth that you can have it all. It's, because it, it's a lie. You can't have it all. It, you can try, and you're going to try, and you're going to try, and you're going to fail, you're going to fail. You want victories, but you're going to fail a lot. And it's so the one thing that if you can understand, the sooner you understand it, the easier it will be to overcome it. A mentor of mine actually explained it to me as like glass balls and rubber balls that, you know, you have to decide in your life. Where are those glass balls that you're juggling? Balls that if you drop them, they will shatter. And what are those rubber balls that when you're juggling, if they drop, they'll bounce back? You have to constantly readjust your priorities. Your glass balls, your health, your faith, 
family. Rubber balls might be your finances. It might be other things, but you have to constantly juggle this. It's not just true for women, it's also true for men, it's true for all of us. Because every choice, every decision you make has a consequence. So, I guess you can say I'm a little angry uh, about those lies of mainstream feminism that have been repeated for the past 50 years in our country. That sex is without consequence, that um, birth control is needed in order to control my biology and make me equal to men that abortion is the solution to our struggle of equality, and that when we choose abortion, it's without risk, and that when we do choose to have, have a family and have a career, that we can have it all and it'll be easy. So where do we go? Are those of us who reject the violence of abortion, of the tearing apart of a unique, whole, living human being, are we just trying to control women's bodies and take away their choices? Nope. I'm fighting for real choice. I'm fighting for non-violent choices. For non-violent health care. That doesn't start with the assumption that pregnancy is a preventable disease. Do you all know when ACA, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare was passed? They actually labeled in order to ensure that health insurance providers had to cover contraceptives in every plan. They actually labeled pregnancy a preventable disease. I'm still very angry about that, and that happened eight years ago. When I carried my children in my womb, they were not a disease that I could get rid of. You need to understand that by sending her off alone to that abortionist, saying, oh yeah, it's your choice, that's wrong. I wrote a book a few years ago, and I interviewed, I had the privilege of interviewing several young women, some who had chosen a life after becoming pregnant in a crisis pregnancy situation, some who had chosen abortion, some who chose the courageous option of adoption. And the one thing we found in every person I interviewed, every young woman I interviewed, was it was the question of who said something to her that changed her mind. One girl, Andrea, who actually uh, ends up placing her son with an adoptive family, she called nine friends in the span of one night. The first eight all told her, it's your choice, I'll support you whatever you do. It wasn't until she got to that ninth person that, and that her friend said, well, you know you don't have to do this, I can help you. When, when Andrea broke down crying and said she didn't want to have the abortion, that she, she needed help. We have to understand that Abortion is not justice for her. That those reasons that have led her to that abortion facility, whether it's poverty, abusive relationships, those reasons are still going to be there the next day. We've potentially compounded and prolonged her struggle. Instead of seeking to build real relationship with her, which is real social justice with her, we've outsourced our duty to Planned Parenthood and the abortion facility, who profits from her despair. They profit from her despair. Planned Parents across the country have abortion quotas. Every facility has a quota, like a sales quota, of how many abortions they have to sell every month. If they're just committing abortions to help women, then why the hell do they need a quota? You tell me what they're about. Friends, it's the pro-life movement, it's the pro-life generation, this generation, that's advocating for supporting women and families in need. We don't believe, we can't believe in just shipping her off to someone else to relieve that crisis. We want to help her build a life for herself and her family. At Students for Life, we have an initiative called Pregnant on Campus, and the group here actually is involved in our Pregnant on Campus initiative. The idea was inspired by pro-life feminists. The idea was inspired like friends of mine like Eleanor, who felt like they had no choice. The idea was inspired by a young girl I actually met this year, Maddie, who became pregnant in her senior year of a Christian high school, who was made to go up in front of her school assembly, admit that she had sinned, resigned from student body president, and was told she was no longer welcome at school. After her parents thankfully fought that decision, the school allowed her to come back, but she wasn't allowed to go to senior week, and she wasn't allowed to walk in graduation. 
It was pro-lifers, not pro-choicers. He took her story to the New York Times. He took her story to the, the Today Show, to CBS, to Fox News, to say this is not right. This is not how we support pregnant parenting women. This is not how we love and support women in our country. That is what our Pregnant on Campus initiative is all about. So like I said, I don't really call myself a feminist anymore. Honestly, less than 20% of American women call themselves feminists, even though women 70% agree with the goals of feminism. It's not really a popular title for many women. I do know I don't want my voice, I don't want my story to be co-opted by today's uh, modern feminist movement. I want the lies that they've, for, they've sold for so long brought to light. I want women to know that the choice isn't either or, isn't her or the child. I want women to feel truly empowered, understanding that their goals and their aspirations can actually be achieved. That love and happiness is found in those things that really matter. I want women in our generation to know that nonviolence and equality, the two of those, two of those fundamental principles of the first wave feminists, the suffragettes, are actually found in the pro-life, anti-abortion movement. That's really the label I care about. So questions, you can line up here, and one question per person, and then you have a second question, you can get the end of the line. both the microphone and you. Yeah, I should I have to move it. Hello? Oh, cool. Hi, yeah, cool. Oh, uh, well, thank you for uh, speaking to us. Uh, it's always nice to have different voices on campus, I'd say. Um, so uh, I came here tonight uh, looking for some arguments and uh, to be, you know, kind of uh, convinced of something. And even though you had a lot of uh, neat points that um, you know, I might argue have varying degrees of uh, misinformation in them. Um, I think that what you, uh, what I failed to get out of this is uh, why should I really care about anything you said? Um, because I think that you made a lot of points, but you didn't show me that those points yield a uh, conclusion, uh, which in your case was an anti-abortion conclusion. So could you uh, sure. explain that, how that yielded that uh, conclusion? Yeah. Please. Well, this is a child of 20, so you can Google it. This is what a child looks like at 16 weeks in the womb. This is what a child looks like at 24 weeks in the womb. Notice that children at 24 weeks almost now survive because our technology is so advanced. Abortion is legal in all nine months through labor and delivery. This is a sofa clamp. This is a tool that we clamp on. You can't ungrasp it to clamp, right? The sofa toll and the curette are the abortion. So a second trimester abortion for a child as big as this, child as big as this, what happens is the abortionist will dilate the cervix with lamaria, certain dilators, open up the pathway into the cervix, right? And he'll grasp the baby and pull the baby apart, limb by limb. When he's finished and he thinks he's pulled the baby apart limb by limb, he takes the curette and he scrapes the inside lining of her uterus to make sure he's got all the pieces out. And then he takes the parts of the baby he's pulled out and he reconstructs them. The head is the most difficult part because obviously, like, look at my grasp. Now I'm a girl. My hands are a little smaller. My husband's would, his wrist going to be bigger. But it's really hard to grasp the skull of a child. And so they have to, that's where they start at the end. They start at the rump, and they pull leg, leg, torso, arm, and then arm, and then all that's left is the baby's head and, and her uterus. And so what they'll do is they'll clamp down, and they squeeze hard enough, and then when, and they have a suction catheter in because they've already suctioned out the amniotic fluid. During that procedure, when white starts coming out, that's the baby's brains, then they'll know they've officially cracked the baby's skull. 
and then they'll pull piece by piece by piece of the baby. That is why you should be against abortion. I mean, that was really just though in a description of how an abortion is performed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no argument there. This child, who's a living, whole human being that's never existed before and will never exist again, who's a member of our human family, who has, who has rights to live, has just been violently dismembered in the act of abortion. That's why you should be against abortion. Next question. Hi, so my main question is um, just in a specific case of like, um, how do you feel about abortion when like the mother's life is on the line and when there might be a, like the baby's life is being putting the mother's life at risk. So it's like mm -hmm. either we can abort the baby or we have a 50-50 shot at having both the baby and the mother be fine or sure. they're both done. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Consistent, don't we? I'm sitting up here saying that this child is a whole living human being that has rights, that has a right to live. And what happens in that case? I think the first thing we have to know that when you're talking about these cases of the mother's life, we have to understand that these cases are actually pretty rare because of how advanced medical technology is today, because of the fact that a child can be born at 22 weeks, can be born at 24 weeks and survive out of utero. So I have a friend who's a former abortionist and is now a pro-life OBGYN and practices in the Washington, D.C. area. And he and I talk a lot about this because, sadly, he sees a lot of these cases where women are told uh, the fetus, the child, is incompatible with your life, that you must have an abortion. She says, no, I don't want to have the abortion. Um, what do I do? And a lot of times the doctor will refuse to treat her because malpractice insurance is something you don't want to mess around with. Wrongful birth lawsuits are very real. There's one going on right now in the state of New York. Uh, a child like mine was born with cystic fibrosis and his parents are arguing that they should have aborted him and suing the doctor for allowing him to be born. So when you have these cases, these very rare cases, and Dr. Wachowski talks a lot about those, the first thing you have to understand is that the abortionist has to, he, the, the OBGYN is two patients. And that's what's kind of different in an abortion. In an abortion, the abortionist, Dr. Lloyd Parker, whoever, they'll talk about the patient, the patient. Well, they're only talking about one patient. OBGYNs actually have two patients. And so the goal is to prolong life for as long as possible. That you want to keep her safe, and you also want to keep that child in the womb growing and receiving the nutrition that he or she needs. Then the goal is, at the point where we know there has to be a delivery that has to be made, you deliver the child. You deliver the child at 21 weeks, at 22 weeks, at 23 weeks, or whatever that might be, and you give that child all the chances of life. You have the NICU on standby. You're there with the oxygen. You do everything you can. You birth the child alive. Whether it's a vaginal birth, whether it's a cesarean birth, you birth the child alive. You don't go in with a sofa clamp and rip the baby apart. You birth the child alive. And you treat the patient you treat them as two patients, and you may not save the child. You may not be able to, but you, you haven't gone in with the intention to destroy the human being. It's the physician's intent. intent. Next question. Hi, so my question is about um, what support. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm adopted, and I was in the foster care system for a while, um, and my biological mom, for whatever reasons, uh, economic, social, physical, mental, all of the above um, just could not keep me. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of children are in the same situation sure. as me, and I grew up with children who are in the same situation, um, some of whom have their own kids now, who for the same reasons they also cannot take care of, some of who aged out of the system when they were 18 mm -hmm. and are now homeless. Um, so my question is, um, how do students for life or pro-life movements, like how have you sure. promoted adoption or affected adoption routes? Because sure. um, there are over 400,000 kids in foster care sure. currently. Um, and my question is because you stated earlier that we should be supporting and empowering pregnant people. I say people because women are not the only ones who can get pregnant. Um, and so because men have uteruses too, which means that men should also have a right to abortion too. 
Um, that's not my, part of my question. I just was um, <laughs> stating that it's okay to disagree with me. Um, my question is, if you say that we should support and empower pregnant people, mm -hmm. how do you empower and support their children? Sure. Well, the pro-life movement definitely advocates for adoption. We talk about adoption a lot. It's a very difficult thing to talk about adoption, especially in a pregnancy center movement or on college campuses, because unfortunately there's a lot of ne ne negative stereotypes about adoption. We actually have done several events where we have famous people, Steve Jobs, um, other like often we advocate for our students to do awareness about adoption. That you know, just because you're adopted, like doesn't mean you know you're going to be a bad person or there's going to be something wrong with you. That adoption is beautiful. That your mother made this horrible sacrifice that you know probably is going to hurt her for the rest of her life so you could have a better life. Um, so we definitely advocate for adoption and we work very closely with adoption agencies across the country. Pregnancy Resource Centers, for example, they're dialed right in. There's more than 3,000 pregnancy resource centers across the country. Every single one of those are dialed in to the adoption networks in their community. When I went into Planned Parenthood, pregnant and I asked them for adoption support. The Planned Parenthood staffer on videotape told me that she didn't know of any adoption resources that she could provide or refer me to. So the pro-life movement definitely advocates for adoption and we do talk about that quite frequently. There's one group in Colorado called Focus on the Family that's made its mission to uh, basically rid the state of foster kids, of kids waiting. Um, and then it's different though, you have to think about the foster care, the goal of foster care isn't adoption, it's to reunite the child with his or her biological parents. It's actually different. So there's, there's some families that say I want to foster and you have to, you have to understand that foster care is a little different. Sometimes there's kids in foster care who are waiting for adoptive families and there's other kids in foster care who are simply waiting for their mother or father. And so you have to understand that. But in Colorado, for example, Focus on Family, a Christian pro-life ministry has single-handedly reduced kids waiting for adoption by 25%. They're going church by church and asking the churches to step up and lead. Because you're right, there's only 400,000 children. That's so easy. If the American church, and I'm saying this because we're at a Christian school, I can say this, if the church actually cared, we wouldn't have any kids waiting for adoption. So, thank you. Next question. the perspective and the, the group that you've brought out. Um, so I'm in a sociology of sexualities class right now, and in our textbook there's an article that I read called I Wasn't Raped But. It's called by, it's written by Nicola Gavey. And this article examines concepts of rape and victimization in the context of our current society. Um, and reflecting on this article really revealed to me the manipulative techniques in which teenage girls are taught to have relationships and give sex. And despite the assumed consent in these situations, there are still feelings of obligation and guilt, which lead to confusion about the validity of your body and the validity mm -hmm. of your, your choices and actions. Sure. So I guess my question is, um, how do you validate using this platform, um, which is seemingly based on fear rhetoric of abortion procedures? No, this is true. Um, I mean, this is scientific right, truth. But Definitely. I, I, I Medical understand. textbooks will show you how to do an abortion. So how do you validate using this platform to support the society that ultimately sets its young women up for failure while simultaneously aiming to rob them of the opportunity to care for themselves or cope with the situation? How is it that the pro life movement is setting women up for failure? Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the pro-life movement is also hand in hand with abstinence movements and mm -hmm. sex education movements all which set women up to have less education about their sexuality. Actually, 48% of young people who've gone through um, sex, so at, would not be absent, so it'd be sexual risk reduction, so that would be comprehensive sex ed, report that the comprehensive sex ed actually made them feel pressure to try sex. So it's not true. So my question was to support the rhetoric of fear in our teenage girls. But how, what is the rhetoric of fear that the pro-life movement is promoting? I'm confused. Fear of going. I'm not, 
fear of making women afraid of going through pregnancy. I'm celebrating pregnancy. I'm saying you can do it. You are strong enough to do it. Students for Life, we actually have a project, a tour going on right now called We Care. And the entire tour is about sexual assault. Where to go if you're a victim of sexual assault. Who to turn to if you're a victim of sexual assault. And we refer them to all the national and the state resources. And then we do talk about abortion at the, in the rare 5% of cases of rape where conception does occur. How do you talk about that? How do you address that? So we're definitely not um, fear-mongering women about rape because we're the ones supporting her. I appreciate you explaining your platform. Thank, Thank you. So you talked a lot about first wave feminism and the early 20th century. Um, when we look at statistically at um, abortion rates and their successes back then, we see that both mother and infant mortality rates were significantly higher back then because it was just pre-scientific advent. And like since then, we've seen drastic improvements in uh, mother, like I guess, person who was having the procedure done, survival rates and things like that. Maternal mortality. My, my question for you is, um, are you like, in your perfect world, how are you able to ban all abortions and not just safe ones? And how are you going to uh, help prevent us from going back to this like late 19th, early 20th century where we see you know, uh, people sure. dying by the dozens? Sure, that's a great question, thank you. So there's a couple of things we talk about. We talk about um, mortality. I think one thing we need to understand is that we actually have countries right now in the world uh, that have banned abortion, or abortion's been illegal forever, um, that actually have better maternal mortality rates than the United States of America. Chile, Ireland, they have better maternal mortality than we do. Ireland, abortion is still illegal. Chile just was legalized, I think, this year. So I don't think that necessarily, you know, saying, oh, you have to have abortion to have morta mortality rates. I think the other thing we have to think about, though, too, is to look at this, the stats before abortion was legal. So in 1963, Planned Parenthood's med medical director, Mary Caldron, spoke out about who was committing late-term, like, who's committing abortions, because there was this myth of the back alley abortionist. She said 90% of abortions at that point were actually being committed by licensed doctors in uh, their practices. They just weren't advertising for the abortion. There wasn't this myth of this you know, back alley abortionists. Bernard Nathanson, the abortionist who founded NARAL, actually came out publicly admitted uh, in the 1980s that his myth that 10,000 you know, 10, women were dying a year from illegal abortions was in fact a falsehood. The CDC rates in 1972, the death rate for illegal abortion, and the death rate for illegal, for legal abortions was actually the same. And abortion isn't safe today. You look today at Con Conrad Monger, uh, who was killed at Kermit Gosnell's facility in Philadelphia. He operated a house of horrors for decades. His abortion facility hadn't been investigated for 18 years. Do you want to know why? Because Planned Parenthood and the abortion lobby went to Harrisburg and lobbied against the bill that would make sure that abortion facilities had to be investigated once a year, like hair salon facilities and veterinary clinics. They said that would prohibit access for women to have abortion. When the DA raided my um, current Gosnell's facility, and the feds raided Kermit Gosnell's facility for narcotics abuse because they were actually giving out narcotics, they found that the waiting room, there were two waiting rooms. One, there was a waiting room for black women, and there was a waiting room for white women that was slightly nicer. There was cat urine and feces all over the, all over the um, facility, all over the waiting rooms that there were rusty tools, and this is all documented in the DA report, who is not a pro-lifer by any stretch of imagination, rusty abortion facility tools, that the, uh, the teenager that was actually administering the twilight medicine actually had made a chart with like happy faces and sad faces so she could not overdose the women. This was a teenager who was administering these high-dose narcotics. They opened up the refrigerator, and there were bodies of babies that he had aborted, stuffed in milk carton jugs. They found more than 50 bodies of babies that he aborted in the basement of his facility. They found out that the doctors that came and talked to his trial, the, the local pediatricians of Philadelphia, said that they'd stopped referring women to his abortion facility because he was using dirty tools that were, they were coming back to their, hit their practices with venereal diseases, and they all knew this, but no one did anything. 
because it was all about access. Abortion is not safe in America today. Next question. Culture of Life is one of the goals of Students for Life, and you brought many examples, as such as the growth of your movement itself, the proportion of federally qualified health centers to Planned Parenthood. So what I want to know is why the abolishment of legal abortion is necessary in creating that culture. Sure. Why do you feel the need to make a choice for millions of other women when abortion could potentially be ended without entering the legislature at all? That's a good question to deal with the Supreme Court state legislatures. We can make abortion unthinkable. We can make it obsolete. And actually when we talk about ending abortion often, we talk about making it unthinkable and illegal because you have to do both. The 13th Amendment in our country banned slavery. Slavery still happens in our country. It still happens. It's still a reality. But it's illegal. It's greatly reduced slavery in our country and everyone would agree with that. But it still happens, and we fight it. We know abortion ends the unique, whole, living life of a human being. Therefore, it should be illegal. There's no reason for it to be illegal. And when you legalize abortion, when you legalized abortion, what did you see? A skyrocketing of abortion rates across the country. Some people, sadly, uh, derive their morality from legality. So there's some people uh, that even though we can have every resource available and the pro-life movement can step up its game in advertising the resources and support that are available to her, there are some, some individuals who still say it's illegal, and it's not. 
moral. It's not right and it's not correct. And so when we talk about abolishing abortion, we talk about a twofold goal of making it unthinkable and illegal. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Madison. Thank you for bringing this perspective to our campus. Um, I wanted to ask a question for you. You talked about um, how women who would love um, children and that's uh, in the society it's looked down upon, but for women who don't necessarily want children um, or who sure. may or may not find that as a result or may or may not have been sexually assaulted, um, what are your policies exactly for providing um, help or financial aid for women who cannot have abortions? Sure. Um, or how do you provide women who cannot afford a child, let alone themselves, sure. And exactly how do you propose that in a society and especially sure. in the Supreme Court? Yeah, definitely. Well, that's why we have 3,000 fairly qualified you know, pregnancy centers. So you have the fairly qualified health centers that can provide all the services to her for free or no charge, uh, or a reduced charge depending on her financial capabilities. But you also have the pregnancy resource centers, that they will come around her and support her with everything that she needs. It's financial support, she needs an apartment, done. Needs a job referral, done. Needs set up on WIC or Medicaid, done. That's what these centers do, and that's why, you know, on college campuses, we, we consider Students for Life kind of that marketing arm. That Students for Life groups are always promoting auctionline.org, where you can go at any time of the day and find these 3,000 centers that provide all these resource support. I would argue that where we failed in the pro-life movement is that we suck at marketing. We suck at marketing. We have all the resources there, but people don't know we're there. They don't know we're five miles from campus. We don't do a good enough job of talking about all the resources that we have. And women are, women are dying, children are obviously dying, because we are not doing our job, so thank you. Hormonal abortion, or sorry, not hormonal birth control with abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a question regarding Sure. That. So, I personally have periods that are very bad. Sure. Um, over 10 days of the month, and very severe pain to the point where I can't even stand up. And a close friend of mine has endometriosis, mm -hmm. and she requires birth control in order to go through her daily life without being in severe pain. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do you have any suggestions for alternatives? Mm -hmm. you? Beyond that? Yeah, and I should think there are alternatives. And I think this is a very serious issue that I think when we talk about modern med medicine, it's really scary. We work with a lot of med students, for example, that when these issues come up in training, uh, endometriosis, polyovarian cystic syndrome, like my sister had, and other things like that, it's, oh, there's a cure, it's birth control. You, do, you deserve a real solution that's not just masking the problem and that's not a carcinogenic drug. We shouldn't be told, okay, I'm going if men were having these problems and we told men just put these drugs in your body that oh, may cause cancer, I can guarantee you modern medicine would find a solution. And there actually are solutions, but once again, they're not widely publicized. And there are physicians who will actually help treat your problem. Help, I don't know, don't go with it. They will help treat whatever medical issue you might be having that don't rely on putting class one carcinogens into your body. Okay, Thank so you. back to my question about that though. No, I, I answered it. Okay, um, okay but you, okay. Didn't, actually, okay. you didn't actually mention any alternatives. Mm -hmm. See, I've been to multiple doctors and they've sure. all only given me birth control as an option and it's worked. Sure. And I haven't had any negative side effects from it and now there is my friend. So my question There's a resource called APLOG, the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs, which would be a great resource for you. Um, a lot of the research has come out of Creighton University there in Nebraska, and it's a doctor who practices NAPRO. So go online and Google NAPRO technology. Both religious people and secular people use NAPRO technology very effectively. Okay, thank you for the other resource. Kind of just a two-part. I, I don't know if you can hear me. We can, I can hear you. Okay, this is kind of a two-part policy question. It's relatively okay. simple, I think. Um, the first is kind of looking at government policies. Do, do you favor? I, this is a clarification. Do you favor a total ban, regardless of circumstances, time period, whatsoever? And the second part of the question is, how would you regulate that? How would you go about making sure that nobody has abortions? Like, what would you do? Sure. Yeah. These are great questions. You guys are asking really great questions. Um, no, I would advocate for a total ban on abortions. I don't think. 
And then this, you know, honestly, it kind of sucks being a pro-lifer sometimes because we have to be philosophically consistent. I have to stand up and I have to defend these beliefs and sometimes it's hard, especially when you're talking about cases of sexual assault because we don't believe anyone should be forced to be a mother and that's one of the many crimes that rapist has committed upon her, forcing her to become a mother. But I would advocate for a total ban on abortions because I can't deny that this is a unique whole living human being that has the same rights that you and I do. I can't do that. And I can't at any point say, well, at this point the fetus and the child has rights, but at this point it doesn't. Because guess what? Science will change next week and something new will happen. Um, in terms of how you enforce it, you would go, I think, and a lot of people have talked about this you know, recently because of the Supreme Court being only one vote away from overturning Roe and sending the decision back down to the states. Um, you make it illegal to commit abortions. And you're not talking about um, jail time for mothers, you're talking about jail time for those who commit the abortions, uh, the abortionists. Yeah. May, may I, you, I, got, I got five minutes and then yeah. the whole line, I'm sorry. <laughs> that the socioeconomic status and the conditions into uh, which children are being born were never necessarily mentioned um, throughout. Obviously, you know, you do have to have certain aspects of presentation. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was born into a family of two active drug users. My uh, dad went to prison shortly after, and I, uh, my mom eventually got clean for me, but not until after years of couch surfing, lived in a homeless shelter for a long time, um, got back on her feet eventually, but she worked at the gas station making a minimum wage. Um, I am an immense drain on government resources. I, it costs $17,000 a year for the government to send me here, but for, uh, roughly $60,000 by the time I graduate. Um, I wouldn't advocate that you are a drain on anyone's resources. You're a human being. But nonetheless, if so many people, if so many children are born into conditions, like I am, as many are, um, and I understand that you worked on uh, both with the Trump campaign and uh, on Bush's campaign, Many conservatives don't believe that I should be receiving the resources that I am in order to go to school. People are overturning college-bound scholarships. People are overturning federal aid, state aid to supporting children like me, saying that I should go to a community college, that you know it's not in my cards to get this kind of education that I'm getting. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that you know a lot. There's obviously a lot of overlap between the pro-life movement and um, people that hold these conservative values regarding regarding how. I should be living my life um, where, I mean, again, part of um, you know, supporting women, supporting children that are not getting abortions, um, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of that falls flat when someone is actually born because policy is being put forward to limit the lives of those children being born, many of who, or many children who maybe would have been aborted are in lower socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. so, what thoughts do you have, I guess, on um, this kind of hypocrisy that exists um, between so being so supportive of keeping a baby, a child, you know, birthing that child, but mm -hmm. then saying you're on your own from here? Sure. Well, I think it's interesting to note that the polite movement is actually varying degrees, and it's a pretty broad movement, um, especially the students that we work with. Um, Students for Life is not a conservative organization. Um, many of the student leaders that we work with are not conservative. Uh, and we actually do have very um, spirited policy debates on many of these questions. I think, though, that when, you, when I hear what you say, um, what, what I kind of internalize from that is you think conservatives just don't care about you. And they don't care about children in poverty. And I think that's wrong. I think that's one of the main failures of the modern conservative movement, the modern Republican Party, is that, um, and I'm speaking as a Republican, although I criticize Republicans more than I do. I'm hard on Republicans usually, but um, I think that's one of the failures, just like I said, one of the failures of the pro life movement, because conservatives, like, you know, in Washington, D.C., and we're in a room and we're talking, it's not like, how can we strip resources from poor babies? It's, that's never the question, and that's never the intent, but I think that's how it's communicated in the mainstream media. I think that's how people take it, and I think that we're not doing, um, I don't think we're doing a good enough job in talking about how we believe that, you know, not only do all Americans have the right to be born, uh, but they have the right to live a prosperous life. And we can disagree on the policies for that. We can totally disagree on that. And 
But I think that what we've lost today in our culture and our society is that while we might disagree on a certain fiscal policy, that means I hate you. Or that I wish children who are born in poverty, or you know, I wish them to live in poverty their whole life. And actually, that's not true. Um, and that's <laughs> one of the arguments we made for pregnant on campus. Because quite frankly, when we introduced pregnant on campus, I had a lot of um, more conservative folks who didn't like the name pregnant on campus because they thought that our name pregnant on campus was actually, you know, condoning pregnancy out of wedlock. And I said, well, no, we're not condoning it, but we have to face the reality that this is this is what's going this is what's going to happen. Um, and the argument I made to, to many of these people was, you know, a child who's born into poverty is seven times more likely to live in poverty his or her whole life. So the best thing that we can do for her, her child, her family, her entire legacy is make sure she graduates college, make sure she gets that job, and she doesn't raise her child in poverty. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we can disagree and, like, we can talk and have, like, go sit down and talk for hours about fiscal policy and how to be responsible with the very limited amount of dollars that we have. Uh, and you know, our huge 20 some dollar, trillion dollar debt that we have in our country right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that just because you and I might disagree on some policy about funding for whatever, doesn't mean that we don't love you and that we don't think that you should have a happy, fulfilled, and prosperous life. Uh, Next question. question. I, we have to, <laughs> it's eight o'clock, so like one more question or? We gotta end at eight o'clock. Okay, so one more question. Okay. One more question. <laughs> we right. uh, hi, hi, my name is Lydia. Um, thank you for coming today and for taking the time to explain statistics and all that stuff because I think a lot of people don't realize and know a lot of those things. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about how your father. Uh, wanted you to become educated and, and do so that you could make choices about what you wanted to do. Now that you've educated us, why um, why don't you want us to have the choice sure. to do what we want to do? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think that women have lots of choices and should be allowed to make many choices. I'm a woman, duh. But I don't think that the choice to violently pay someone, to violently dismember or suck apart your child is a choice that should ever be legal. That there's a lot of things in our society that you can't do. You can't walk into a hospital, for example, especially a pulmonary uh, ward like my children stay in, and light up a cigarette. Why? Because you're putting those children at risk. You're putting yourself at risk for oxygen tanks to blow up. There's a lot of things that you can't do with your body. We believe in choices in the pro-life movement, but some choices are wrong. And the choice of abortion to kill an innocent living human being that's never existed before and never will exist again, who's simply there, um, he, he or she doesn't deserve that, that violent death. That's not a choice that we believe you should be able to make. Thank you. Thank you.